working hard to achieve four goals at the same time. The first is to make the very best biochar. The second is to use as much of the process energy as possible. The third is to eliminate as many emissions as possible. And the fourth is to make the whole process as profitable as possible for everyone. No matter what biomass we put in, we get out carbon. This is how we really mean to take a bite out of our carbon footprint. Good stuff. I'm Abraham. I work here um, with Dan uh, and Johnny, and we operate this facility. And uh, in making our biochar, we have to have feedstock. And we're fortunate enough to be in the southeast where there's very plentiful amount of feedstock, primarily from trees. And so that's our main biomass resource is sawmill slab. If you invest it in a machine, you're going to be scrounging around looking for feedstock. So it's been very key to our success to keep us running, keep our jobs going, to keep bringing in feedstock, keep bringing in biomass. Like I said, we're fortunate enough to live where we do, and um, we can pick and choose kind of what, what works best for us. And so we work with four local sawmills, um, and we go on runs at least once a week to bring in feedstock. The feedstock needs to sit once we, once we get it, at least from several sources, um, and dry. Because we don't want to put wet wood in our retorts because then we'll, we'll just be using a ton of energy just driving off water essentially. So what we do, the, the process is we got our truck over there, the flatbed, and we've dropped off four racks. He loads his, his sawmill slab um, from his pile onto these racks for us, and then we run around and we, we straighten it all out, and um, we, we cut off the ends to length because, you know, we're, we're limited to about seven feet in length, um, and then he, he uses that for his wood boiler to heat and dry, kiln dry his wood, which is part of his business. And then uh, we strap, we ratchet strap the, the loads. We, he loads them on our truck and we ratchet them down again. So we have like a total of 10 ratchets going on there. And then we drive it here. We unload it with our forklift and um, we set it up on props on the, on the sidewalk. And then we put these metal, these metal bands on, um, which we can reuse after we're, after we're done with it. And um, take the ratchet straps off. And then we can start the process again when he's when he's ready. And we can probably go there. Um, a lot of this is another consideration is depending on his production. So during the winter, his production really slowed down, and a lot of the waste that he was using, he was keeping on his farm for his own personal heat needs. Um, so it's kind of like we got to diversify. We can't count solely on one sawmill operator. Um, so then we've got a pallet manufacturer, and they send us resaws. And so they'll they'll cut boards. I don't know, eight, ten quarter and then they'll resaw to the three quarter inch that they need to make pallets. And so in doing that, they get you know, about half inch to quarter inch waste that are, you know, that are pallet size dimensions. And so, and then, and then we get these for, and then we built, once again, we built racks. We wanna make it as easy and for these guys as possible uh, to, make, to have them help us. Um, our business depends on it. And, um, and so they, they stack these in racks that whoever's running their, uh, their resaw, they just throw them on these racks and they've been kind enough to stack them in a stickered kind of fashion. So they dry a little bit uh, more consistently. Um, so you can see these are just all kind of waste for them. And before, I don't even know what they were doing with these. I think they were just putting them in a mulch pile um, and so, or running them back through their chipper, which is you know, more labor for them. So we're actually helping them out uh, by taking these. Um, so we'll get big, big cube racks of these. These are great for um, if we if we take a slab wood bundle, we load it in, and there's not just enough enough wood to fill it up. We'll take these and we'll top it off with with this. So we use these for a lot of fill in. Occasionally we'll do uh, full loads with these uh, if they're the right dimension. Sometimes they're like 48 inches and they're just like a little bit too long to stick sideways in the in the retort or stack appropriately. Um, so we'll just kind of mix them in loads and um, stick them in there so that we can get some airflow through there. So. Another, another uh, place where we get the um, sawmill slab is from uh, a big circle sawmill, and so their slab was a little bit, a little bit bigger, a little bit bulkier sometimes than uh, the stuff that's just run by a band sawmill. 
Uh, we started out, they would come here and then dump loads in our, in our lot over there by the tractor. And um, we would be out there physically in the afternoons when the loads were running and kind of, kind of, you know, where we didn't have to keep such a vigilant eye on them. Um, and we'd be out there loading these racks by hand, cutting them to length, and banding them and putting them in the kiln. A tremendous amount of labor. Um, so that was that was one of the, the the first issues that we had to deal with was getting our feedstock labor down, um, and so having being able to work or build a relationship with the fellows at these sawmills, so we we're like, hey, can we drop some racks and you can load them for us and put them on our truck? And um, sure, that's fine. You know, we, we give him a we give him kind of a set fee per bundle, so he's not he's not losing out. He's essentially getting compensated for his time, and we're getting the sawmill slot for free. This here, the sticker bundle right there, that comes from. Down in uh, Swannanoa, and they uh, they're essentially a, a mold molder planing um, shop. I'd say it's kind of large, but they're still you know kind of small business. And um, so I've developed a relationship with uh, that uh, guy out there over the course of years, buying wood from him because he also does uh, finishing and lumber. And so um, and he's near my house, and so I knew him, and I was seeing that he was generating this waste. And so we've worked it out with him too, where we get all his. Uh, strip ends. Uh, before he was just putting them out in his yard and there's just a bunch of crazy locals that would come by, chainsaw them, get his guys to like, I mean they make a huge mess in his yard and, um, and they don't, he doesn't get anything from it. Takes his guys away from their work because they want to get loaded on it on a, to a trailer or a truck and they're tying up the forklift. And, but he still has to get rid of this. Occasionally potters would come by and he'd load up for a, for a potter kiln, potting kiln. Um, so I started talking to Lynn and he was more than happy to let me come by once or twice a week depending on his production once again depending on their production and um, and take everything one foul swoop takes him about 10 minutes to load me up and I'm gone and we uh, we compensate him for his time as well um, and so those those bundles um, have been extremely valuable for us if our slot if our slab is is, is wet there's been a lull in other operations um, we, we've come to rely on those um, especially when uh, before we had our gasifier modifications, which we'll show you, we were using the cut ends from those strips to fuel and initiate our entire process. Uh, so that's been a very valuable resource. So what we do with these is we put them in a rack, as you see right there. We, we'll pick it up with a forklift, put it in front of the retort, cut it with a chainsaw to the right length, load it in, load the strip ends on top, and that's a ready-made bundle, a ready-made load. Um, and those are those are very easy for relatively easy to deal uh, with for us uh, apart from apart from picking up the pieces on the chainsaw and loading them in but we have to do that anyway uh, whether it's with slob wood or, or some other sort of feedstock uh, so those are our primary types of uh, another huge benefit to those is that they're dry um, they've half the wood that he does is like already kiln dried and so and it's mixed species too it's like pine and pop mostly poplar and pine we got oak cedar um, we've got one in there that's sapile, some sort of uh, mahogany type wood um, that he, you know, he imports, or he doesn't import, but he gets all kind of wood. Um, walnut, mostly local stuff, hickory, um, but it's all dried and it's all in a size and dimension that um, if it's stacked correctly in the retort, the heat is going to penetrate. And we get, we get very high quality loads out of that. It's not like putting a, it's not like putting a piece of wood like this in the retort where the where the it's just going to take so much energy to penetrate inside of that wood um, that it's it's almost not worth our time because the outside will be charred really nice char but the inside still is still uncharred so, so do you cut it then? this no we, this will this yeah we could cut for further processing but this is in a in a shape that we use it for um, we use it for stickers like out here that's like what this bundle is these are Four buys for setting bundles and stuff on. Yes, ma'am. What moisture content are you getting around to? Do you just use a moisture meter to say when it's ready? Yep, we use a we use a moisture meter, a combination of uh, time. We, we kind of keep track of how long these have been in here, and they're kind of stacked in here, kind of like a grocery store. You just kind of know what you got um, and when you got it. Um, and so this is a solar drying kiln. Um, so right here, uh, there's these vents that come down. Half of this ceiling, the back side of this building, is a solar air collection space. It's got a translucent roof. It's painted, the interior space is painted black and insulated. You can see the foam spread insulation and these big uh, silver 
um, HVAC pipes line. So there's there's fans in there that when the temperature gets up um, over, I believe it's like what then is over 100 degrees, it starts to it starts to pump that hot air down into the kiln, and then our our vents are at the back and bottom of the of the kiln wall, and then it recirculates back up into the attic. And so on a on a day when the sun's shining, it can be cold. You know, it'll be 30 degrees outside, but it'll still be pumping 102 degree, 104 degree air down in here. And the summer we've seen it as high as 150 degrees in that roof, which is kind of like we don't like to get a lot hotter than that. So that's that's one of the things that's that's really working for us in here. Besides being dry, we're moving hot air through here. That really dries it. The slab is one of our low temperature lines, meaning that we circulate low temperature water that we've heated from our retorts underneath this floor. And so that heats the floor up. Uh, we usually generally pump about 100, 220 degree water through it. it, it the, the slab soaks it up and all that heat starts to radiate up. And as that's happening, what we're doing is we're, we're driving off the moisture from here. And then we have humidistat fans that are in the back that when the humidity reaches um, when, when the humidity in here is higher than it is outside, those fans kick on and they suck out any humid, any moisture. And then they shut off and let kind of the process continue. So that's how we dry this wood. A big bundle like this um, with some of these thick pieces, um, it can still take a while to dry. And so as far as, as, far as our, our number, our key number is 20% moisture content, but we've also got to keep up production. And so, you know, when it's been in here a while, we put it in the retort. Is there a question over here? Just when it comes in, at what percent? How long? How fast will that get down to your twenty percent? Um, it depends on the conditions outside. Um, in the summer, these things will dry pretty well. For it to get down to where we want it and it's a good load, it'll take about a month. Um, and we don't often have that long. Um, so, but if but if we've if we've and we've got two of these kilns right now. We're, we've, we needed that kiln for a lot of other space during this last kind of half quarter of the year. Um, so we're not using that as a kiln, but we can and we have the idea is that we fill this up with wood and we let it sit and while, and then while this is drying and we're starting to pick at it, we're filling this one up. So by the time we get done with this kiln or at least this half a kiln, we can be, we can be using that wood and filling that one up. But you got back of heat right there. Right? Okay, that's not, that's not something I haven't talked about, too. Those are Modine uh, air, water air fans. And we, those take, those like about 140 degree water. Um, they can run at lower temperatures, but not as efficiently. Those really help to, to, to move the moisture and the humidity out of the wood and dry the, and dry the wood. So those um, are once again heated by our system. And then we, those are high temperature lines as opposed to the low temperature water lines here. And those, you know, pump the hot air water the, the the hot water heated air across this across these across the wood and that and that really helps as well the the air movement. What's the maximum thickness that you put in the retort as a rule? We try not to put anything more than four inches. Um, and if you cut it shorter, like if you like you if you have a six inch wide piece of firewood, but if it's only this long, chances are you're gonna char it because the gases can escape a lot easier. Um, but yeah, when you, the, the greater the thickness of the wood, the more energy it's gonna take to penetrate in there. That's why we like these bundles. They're dry, um, they're not, the pieces aren't, aren't more than four quarter or an inch. Um, and, and, and when they're stacked in there, not so tight, because you can also do that. You can take a bunch of those sticks and you can stack them together really tight and stomp on them in the center. And then basically you've made a log about this big and, and the air can't penetrate, or the gases can't leave the retort quite as easily. Um, okay, so this is our this is our basic feedstock process, nuts and bolts, and then we take the forklift, pick up a bundle, and drive it over to the retorts and load it up. Any questions? Yes. Is there anything else you can use? Because lumber eventually is not going to be, I and mean, hopefully we'll be not locking so much in the future. This is what we use on our on our locality. Um, but you can use um, you can use forest waste. You can use agricultural waste. Um, there's so much that the loggers do, just leave in the woods, the tops of the trees, like corn stover, um, like agricultural waste. Yeah, I mean you can use corn stover if you use switchgrass. Um, just salvage 
we salvage construction materials if it's not painted or polyed or you know nailed too heavily or anything like that. Um, anything with carbon you can use, carbon based. Um, so whatever is is available that is carbon and that you can you can put in a retort and still get some some gas flow through will turn into biochar. You just said something about nails. I wondered about nails and staples and things like that. Those are a consideration when they're in quantity. Um, we do our best to not let any nails or screws or staples get into our loads. Oh yeah, you can use bones. These are, whatever these are, goes in comes out. Yeah, whatever goes in that is, so, that is primarily carbon based is going to come out carbon. Um, yeah. So this is, a, this is a cow jaw. Uh, the teeth, even the teeth are, are turned into biochar. And this is a deer vertebrae. And that's, you know, that's, that's solid carbon now, too. Um, yeah, so if, if uh, some staples or screws, obviously it's just mixed in with the char, and, and that you, you just don't want that in your char. Is that basically the issue? Yeah, you don't want that in your char. Um, we, our, our unloader over there that's sitting out in the rain, the big green crazy-looking spider machine over there, that won't pick up nails for whatever reason. Um, it'll pick up char, it won't pick up gravel, and it won't pick up nails. So that was our main consideration with trying to keep all the nails out, is that we don't want a nail to get in there and damage our machine or create a spark in a highly dust-activated environment. Um, so, but what we've learned through experience is that it will vacuum out a whole load of char, and if there's a couple nails or staples or screws or something in that, that we missed, um, they'll just be on the bottom, along with the, along with the gravel. If there's a, you know, that's, that's one of the issues with this, with this um, feedstock is that when he, when he picks it up with his skid steer, we'll get, we'll get rocks and gravel and stuff like that, which, which we don't want. Um, okay. Is, is the char product solely carbon? Best case is 90%. 90, okay. Right, there's other minerals that were in the Everything that wood. would be ash yeah. as minerals is still in there. Well, I know you don't like to use sawdust, but what about this stuff they do with chips, chip and saw, uh, that they make particle board out of? Can you go that low, or is even that? In this fine? in this particular unit, we can't use anything that is going to compact um, and not leave any airspace. So, like, we couldn't put straight wood chips in in these retorts, and we couldn't put sawdust in there. There are biochar making machines that were operate on a continuous sort of auger feed that allow for um, those gases to still flow because they're feeding them in at a slower rate. But this being a batch system, um, kind of we, we put what we're gonna put in there, close the lid down and, and crank it up. Okay, moving down to the production.